What I'm aiming to do here is give you an overview of where we sit within the Irish sport horse industry vis-a-vis -vis Europe. Then I'm going to look at some trends in the, since the new breeding policy was introduced by HSI in 2010. And then I'm going to specifically hone in on registration of foals and some new initiatives within HSI, largely Coppel Ore and the Irish Horse Gateway. So the industry itself, where do we sit, how many people are involved, etc., etc. Again, Declan mentioned the UCD study, and in that, it uh, highlighted that annually, this industry that we're all involved in with um, contributes 708 million to the to the uh, to the uh, to the um, Irish economy. That's a, a significant amount of money annually to be contributed to the economy. It also supports uh, 124,000 sport horses and 12,500 FTEs. There are full-time equivalents. So. 12,500 people are employed in the sport horse sector. That's aside altogether from the thoroughbred sector, which is approximately 16,000. So just to put it in perspective, there's an awful lot of money in, this, in the thoroughbred sector, but our employment figures are fairly comparable. 47,000 people involved in the sport horse industry here. So again, as um, Declan said earlier, it's a most densely populated, uh, co country in Europe as far as people for horses, but also the number of people who are involved in the industry is, is huge, 47,000. Breeding accounts for the largest section, 32%, and you can see it here in the distribution of expenditure. It's probably no surprise to all of you who are involved in breeding, but it's a significant amount. And second is employment. So those two areas are hugely significant to the industry and to the country as a whole. Slightly more worrying would be the age profile of, of us breeders. Um, you can see here that in 2011, and that's actually 2011-2012, only 8% are under, th under 30. And if I go to the other end, from 50 to 60 years, we have 50% of the breeders in that age category. And that's an increase from 2005. And if you look at the under 30s, that's a decrease from 2005. So that's a little worrying, and initiatives that we run, such as the Young Breeders Initiative jointly with Chagosk, I think hopefully will help reverse that um, statistic. But it's one certainly uh, we need to keep an eye on. Okay, where do we stand in Europe? And Wendy might have apologised for one of the, the graphs she had, but this is even worse. But it's only just to show you the trends. Um, uh, starting from the bottom, if you have the Westphalian stud book, the Hanoverian, the Trakaner, the Oldenburg and the Holstein, all the, the largest of the German stud books, there's quite a few more, but if you combine the total there, you have 17,000, sorry, 18,700 as a total number of foals produced in, in the larger stud books in Germany. If you compare that to Ireland, which is flying in there, 5,010 last year foals. You can also see the Irish foal figure is declining. That's the most recent year, the wobbly dot, and back up to our peak. I'll show you a trend now in a moment. If you compare the Irish one, I'm just going to pick out one other, is the Belgian warm blood. And if you recall back to Wendy's presentation there about the world rankings, the Belgian warm blood punch well above their weight. They're right up there in the rankings with their average uh, six horses achieving over 8,000 8, points. So like that's, that stud book is probably the most successful currently. For the number of horses that we're producing, despite our disappointment in, in show jumping and the rankings this year, we still are punching well above our weight given the numbers. Uh, but obviously always more, more scope for further growth. This is showing the same thing, but it's showing it on the trends over the years of the number of foals being produced. And the only reason I really wanted to show this was the Irish stud book is in white, and you can see it quite a steep decline. I want you to remember that because I'm going to come back to it vis-a-vis -vis foal registration. So if you remember from 2008, it was uh, about 7,500 7 and, and down now to the 5,000. We'll come back to that later. But if you look at the German total, 
it's dropping very severely. And a lot of the German stud books would be very concerned, this year in particular, uh, with the, the decrease in, in the foal registrations. It's not unique to Germany, it's right throughout Europe. And the point I'd like to make is that us as breeders in Ireland, we have an opportunity. Roll that on if the trend continues, as it is projected to do so in Europe, over the next six to eight years, there's going to be a shortage. There's going to be a shortage of top performance horses. Some would argue there, there is currently, but there certainly, if the foal numbers drop throughout Europe, there will be an opportunity for a country who can produce what the market wants. So I just want to leave that as a kind of a positive thought in your minds. Um, and it's acknowledged by all of the main stud books, the French, the, the, the German stud books, and the KWPN. Okay, 2010 I mentioned we introduced a new breeding policy. It was to be open and transparent system with public stallion classifications. And any of you who have been to the stallion inspections in Cavan, uh, you will have seen that where there's a public appraisal of each horse and the scores are read out publicly. We're trying to provide the maximum amount of information to breeders and that is an ongoing work in progress. We'd like to be able to do more in the future on that, uh, on that particular goal. We provide through the stud book direction regarding which stallions are approved and in other words, they're the ones that we're trying to recommend breeders to use. Stallions and mares on top of approval or, or select status are given additional merits. Again, to try and give an indication as to whether it's a, a very good uh, show jumping stallion or a venting stallion and how good. Is it through his own performance or is it through his progeny? So they were the principles back in 2010 and that followed a lot of consultation with the breeders around the country and the stakeholders. So the breeding goal, and this is the benchmark for everything else that we put upon it. The Irish Sport Horse Stud Book wishes to produce a performance horse that is sound, athletic, with good paces and suitable temperament to be competitive at the highest international level in FEI disciplines. Now this is a show jumping conference, so I'll focus specifically on, on show jumping. But that's the goal, to aim horses to be competitive at the highest international level. Stallion classification. I'm not going to go into the details here. Suffice to say that approved is where we're trying to encourage breeders to use. The preliminary approved are the young horses that, as Wendy mentioned previously, we would also encourage you to use. They've met all the requirements on inspection. They look like good prospects for the future, and they are the horses that are preliminary approved. The not approved one and not approved two are the horses not approved two that have not met the veterinary requirement, and not approved one they wouldn't have met some other requirement, such as movement, confirmation, or athleticism, as part of their basic assessment. So, all of this classification comes down to the mares and the stallions, trying to highlight the ones that are best within the stud book. So these are the results for the mare inspections over the last three years. And as you can see, the numbers in total of Irish sport horse mares that come out for inspection um, out of a total population to only get 126 up to 154 in 2011 to come out for inspection. It's, it's actually, it's very, very small. We'd love to see more mares out for inspection and in so doing we'd be able to provide the information back to the breeders as to what the mare was like and they'd have the um, linear profile sheet to, to identify her strengths and weaknesses. So firstly, I'd like to encourage you all, if you haven't brought a, a sport horse mare that you have out for inspection, to bring her out. It can only be positive. You'll know where you stand with the mare and it'll give you an indication as to her strengths and weaknesses. And as Declan said, from an independent panel of inspectors. On the other hand, comparing it to the Irish draft mares, there's a much more, given that the Irish draft population is much smaller, there's a much more um, ingrained and, and developed ethos in bringing mares out for inspection. So the numbers there are much higher. And you can also see the numbers that achieve both class one for the Irish draft and the numbers that achieve select for the sport horse. So that's the highest classification in the stud book. Looking briefly at the stallions, and the stallions you probably have all this information already because it's readily available on the website, the HSI website, with the pictures and the critique of the stallions. But again, just the number of stallions that have come out for inspection in the Irish Sport Horse Stud Book, 32 last year, 36 and 40. And you can see the number who have met with approval it was eight last year, 
preliminary approval for and met their stage one. And the stage one is the veterinary, the athleticism and movement, and um, the, the loose jumping. The st Irish draft stallions, on the other hand, were 15 last year, 21 in 2012, and 2011, it isn't quite a blip that there was so money in 2011. It was that the older, the horses that were classified under the old regime had a, an opportunity to bring them out again. And that's what happened. There was an increased number there. And you can see then that six last year met with their class one status, five the previous year and 10 in 2011. And looking at the approval of the Irish drafts in the sport horse stud book, because last year these horses are largely three and four, none of them had met that yet. It's an automatic approval if they've jumped four double clears at 120. But none of the young horses from last year have done that yet. Five from the previous year and three from 2011. Okay, now let's have a look and see what you, the breeders, are doing within this policy. That's the framework of the policy, which I just flew through. But what, what is the breeder reaction to it? Well, first of all, looking at the usage of NA1 and NA2, so in other words, not approved stallions, on five-star mares. Now, they're the best mares within the country. And what has happened during that period is the usage of those stallions has decreased from 22% um, in 2008, back to 5% in 2012. And in all um, evidence, you would say, well, that's good. Yeah, you'd like to see the best mares going to the best stallions possible. On the other hand, the usage of four and five star stallions on five star mares, so again, this is your, your top crosses, best mares to best stallions, and that has increased from 49% to 55%. So again, great, going in the right direction. Let's look a little closer at the full population. We know that those elite mares and stallions are a very small part of that pyramid, the top section of the pyramid. The breeding objective with elite performance, now I'll explain what I mean by elite performance there. That's three star mares or better and three star or better stallions. So the, again, we're still up in that top pyramid and that's 2% of all the population in the stud book. Those breeders who have a one star, uh, are using a one star stallion up to three star and have a select mare. That's 44% of the population. So they're the breeders who have a, a very nice mare, have come out for inspection, she's met her classification and they're using a star rated stallion from one to three star. Then you have the people who are using approved stallions with no star ratings and a mare who has also come out for inspection. And that's, that's a select mare on an approved stallion. That's 26% of all the horses, all the crosses in the, in the stud book. The final one is stallions who, are, uh, stallions who are either NA1 or NA2 crossed to mares that are entry. Now, they might be good entry mares. We don't know. They haven't come forward for inspection. There may be some gems there that we don't know about. And there may also be mares in there that are being wasted on, on using lesser stallions because the breeder maybe doesn't appreciate what the gem they have. That's worrying from a stud book's point of view to have almost 30% of the crosses year on year um, being entry mares to NA1 or NA2 stallions. But what impact does it have? Never mind the stud book. What impact does it have for the breeder? Those entry ones that I've just been talking about, the average they get at sales, now that's overall average, is 1,300. This is as folds. So it's a really big number of folds and it's a very big cross-section of, of uh, types and breeds. If a breeder goes to an approved stallion and has brought their mare out for inspection, on average, they get 32% more return. If, on the other hand, the mare has come out for inspection, and they use a performance stallion from one to three star, they'll get 184% more return. And if they're lucky enough to have a three star mare or better, this goes back to what Declan said earlier, three star mare and better and going to a three star stallion and better, they'll get a return of 413% more than the baseline figures here. So it's in your interest 
never mind the stud book, but it's in your own interest as a breeder to certainly aim to upgrade the, sta the, mares, and sta the mares that you might have if that's the case. There's a financial return and it links back very directly with what Declan highlighted earlier for you in the sales. I'm going to look at full registration and it's a very hot topic at the moment. Why should you register your foal? It seems very fundamental and very basic and it is. By law it's required that each foal should be registered six months of age or the December of its year of birth. So simply put, if your foal is born in May, June, July this year, it should be registered by December, and that's according to the legislation. So there should be no foals in the country or no yearlings or two-year-olds or three-year-olds that haven't been registered. It's important, while no, none of us aim to breed a horse that ultimately ends up going to the factory, it's important because if they're registered within that time frame, the foal will not be stamped out of the food chain. If, on the other hand, it's registered as a yearling or subsequently, it will be stamped out. And there's nothing that can be done about that either because that is, again, according to the, the legislation, the EU legislation, and we're required to do so. The third point is that if you register your foal in accordance with the legislation, it's cheaper. The DNA is included and it's most cost effective to do it as a foal. And if the, if the vet is coming out in any case to check that your mare is okay after foaling or to prep her for subsequently putting her in foal again, again you avoid the call out fee. Foals with recorded breeding achieve higher sale prices. Now let's have a look. Having said all that, it's required by law, it's in your benefit, it gives you a better return. Let's look at the statistics. Last year, as we said, there were 5,800 uh, 5, um, foal passports issued within uh, Horse Sport Ireland. And that's a combination of Irish draft and Irish sport horse. I'd like you also to bear in mind that figure of 795. They're ID documents. And I'm going to come back to that in just a, a moment. And I'm equally going to come back to this line, where in total... There were 5,500 ID documents issued last year. And that's a little bit frightening. So within Horseport Ireland, we actually issued 14,300 passports of various types last year. And that's, of course, aside from donkeys and, and pony passports and other, other passports. Now, given that I've said it's required by law, etc., etc., to have your foal registered in the year of birth, Let's have a look at the trends here. There were 8,500 on the previous slide adults. Here we go, that figure. That translated into what age were they? Is this graph. So some of them were born, 1,700 of them were born the previous year, so they were yearlings. If I skip on past the two year olds, the three year olds, there were 1,200, nearly 1,300 of them. Four year olds, nearly 1,400 and so on. It drops off after that. So the trend, the trend is such that as a three and a four year old is when a lot of breeders are waiting to register their, their stock. I presume it's because you want to see are they any good? Are they going to compete? That's fine. But at that point, if you discover, if you make the discovery at that stage that they aren't, aside from the legislation, it's very late to be registering them. If they're sold in that intervening period, you also get no recognition. So if they turn out to be superstars, nobody knows it was you that bred them. So that is a, a startling kind of trend. And to, again, um, I'll come back to that one. Just to come, uh, it's a startling trend and certainly one that is worrying if it was to continue into the future. Just, I, I'll go back here an aside, but I want to keep on the, the white passports, uh, the ID documents and the green ones. This year, HSI offered um, breeders the option of having their foals identified as being traditional. So that's an Irish draft, an Irish sport horse with no continental breeding or thoroughbred. So any of the three combinations without continental breeding and it's identified. And so far, there's actually 409 foals um, have been registered and identified as traditional. For those breeders who are interested in traditional breeding, it will be recorded in both the database and on the passport for you. Okay. 
just one point on these white ID documents. Um, this here is not a stud book passport. It is, as it says, it's an ID document. It records that it's a horse, the colour of it, the markings of it, and the microchip. And that's potentially it. So this is really not worth it for any serious breeder who is in it for the long haul and trying to produce a performance horse. It meets the minimum legislation, and that's grand. But it's a short-term solution for a serious breeder. This, on the other hand, is the stud book passport. It has your breeding recorded, sire and dam, DNA verified, and it is the one that will achieve more returns for you in the longer term. And as I've said already, there's a worrying trend happening at the moment. Prior to 05, all the passports issued by then the Irish Horse Board, all of them were stud book passports. Now, legislation changed and things moved on. There were a lot of horses in the country who had no passport. So therefore, it came in through the EU that a white ID document was better than a no document. And that's fine. It is. Certainly, we know how many horses are in the country and we know where they are. But you can see immediately there was a decrease in the number of stud book passports. And the low here was stud book passports, only 44% of all the passports issued by um, Horseport Ireland in that year. We've been trying to address that and encourage breeders to, to get a, a stud book passport in subsequent years. But even in 2012, only 64% of breeders of horses in the country received a passport that was a stud book passport. And that leaves 36% who received that, albeit slightly cheaper, ID document. So why not get this slightly cheaper? And the difference being 35 euro vis-a-vis -vis 50 euro. It's a very small difference at that stage in the foal's life. 158% less returns, now this is as a three-year-old, at public sales than animals who have a, a HSI, a, sorry, an ISH stud book passport. So why do you want an ID document when you obviously know the breeding of the siren dam at that stage as a foal? No breeding and no breeder recognition. If the horses are subsequently successful, many times it's impossible to verify their ancestors. So if you end up with the next ISH that's sold and is competing for America, sometimes we can track them, but many times we can't. So they're lost to you as a breeder and for your recognition of your breeding program. It's obvious that the breeder knows the siren dam in that year of, of foaling. And also at that point, the DNA is free to you, the, you the breeder. So it's, for there, it's there forever, no matter what happens to the horse, or no matter what happens, even if the passport is lost and separated from the horse, which shouldn't happen, but even if it does, the records are there and it can be traced back. So I would urge you to please consider, any of you who haven't registered your foals already this year, to just think about what you're doing for the long-term benefit of, number one, the stud book, number two, yourself, and largely, if we end up with so many ID documents, even for the rankings, a lot of our horses are lost. We're actually breeding a lot more horses than the stud boat record would show. And that is ultimately up to yourselves to make a decision on that one. Some of it is down to um, maybe disagreements due to lack of clarity at the time of covering. So when you're bringing your mare to be covered, be really clear. Be fair to both stallion owner and mare owner. Be clear up front and have a, a contract in place as to what the terms are. Whether it's payment up front, whether it's no foal, no fee, whether it's no foal, free return, or any other option that might be there. The stallion owners are required to return the covering certs by the 31st of October in the year of covering. It doesn't always happen, but certainly that is the requirement and we in HSI over the next year will be uh, trying to encourage that even more. Mayor owners, from your side, you should keep a record of the covering invoice and the payments that you make. So rather than doing cash deals where you have no record of what was paid, 
keep it by either electronic transfer or check or some form that you can at least know and prove what was paid subsequently. That's an aside from the stats and the stud book side of things. It's a contract between yourself and the stallion owner. So try and make sure that both for the stallion owner and for yourselves, the mare owner, that you're clear in the agreement in the first instance and the payment in the second instance. That will alleviate some of the difficulty down the road when the foal is born and you're trying to register your foal. Stud book rankings. I'm going to fly through this because Wendy has done a, a very thorough job on it. The show jumping rankings, obviously very disappointing in 12th place. Uh, we have been hovering in making progress from 11th, 9th and 8th. And the reality is, as Wendy says, without the <coughs> tremendous results of Flexible last year, we were without a star performer. And when you're only counting six, six horses, you need a star performer to keep up in the rankings. So it's strength and depth, and uh, it is a disappointing uh, statistic. The only positive is the number of Irish sport horses this year that contributed to the Nations Cup's teams. We had 14 Irish sport horses contributed to teams uh, competing for Ireland this year. That augurs well. They're young horses and they're up and coming. So I, I hope that the trend reverses slightly. But with a small herd and a smaller number of performance horses, we just need to focus on this to try and stay up in the rankings. Eventing, on the other hand, has been a, a much more uh, happy hunting ground for the Irish Sport Horse Stud Book over the last 18 years. We, 18, yeah, we've won it for, the la for 18 years and we had a blip for two years in the last 20. So it's a tremendous achievement and this year while the gap with the second stud book, uh, the Hanoverian stud book, was considerably narrowed, uh, we still managed to win it again. And with eventing becoming more and more popular and more events throughout the year, it's, it's going to become more competitive. And equally, other competitor stud books, such as the KWPN, they're now focusing on eventing. So it's, it's in our interest, certainly, to focus on, on the eventing um, market and not to, uh, not to let that one slip. But we're, we're there at the moment um, up a, in the leading stud book. Achievements. Obviously, one of the main achievements was um, Arabeg Clover and Greg and Hopefully Greg will uh, tell us later on how he achieved that. It was a tremendous achievement and not to be underestimated. There were 242 horses in that class. And just to put it in perspective, it's not only qualifying to be one of the 15 Irish sport horses to get there, but it's to jump clear throughout the three days of competition at Lanarkin. And it is not to be underestimated as a, a serious achievement. We'll come back to it a little later. Lanarkin, again, Wendy showed a little bit of this, uh, the trends over the last number of years. And what I have here is basically the um, number the, in blue, the number who qualified for the final, bearing in mind that we bring 15 horses only every year as the stud book quota. And then in 2009, Clem won the, the uh, sorry, no, in 2009, um, the Army won with uh, Drummiller Lock silver medal. And that was our first taste of real um, success at Lanarkin, given the numbers of, of horses from the best stud books present. And then in 2010, um, Clem won with Kulal Clover and Ballypatrick Mystique won a, a, a bronze, so a gold and a bronze. And you can see there that we had nine horses through to the final. So out of 15 that went, nine went through to the final. And that means literally jumping within time clear for the two qualifying days, which in itself is a huge achievement. And then this year, again, gold medal for Arabeg Clover and Greg Broderick. So the trend is good at this level and young horse level. It's, it's, we're very competitive. In fact, we're probably right up there if you were to look for all the stud books, given the strength and depth that KWPN and the German stud books would have. We've had tremendous success at Lanarkin. Looking at the developments within the stud book, just two brief things. Coppelore, which I'm sure at this stage you're all aware of, is the online Irish register. And it contains every horse that's registered in the stud book um, from, the ver from the various stud books, every horse that's registered with Horse Sport Ireland. Irish Draft stud book, Irish Sport Horse stud book, the Kerry Bo Bog Pony stud book, miniature ponies, and also the donkeys are there. Um, but new developments. 
Copple Ore is now available if you go on as a member of the public and not as a member of the Irish Horse Board or if you haven't bought any credits. So you just want to log on and find out some basic information. We've changed that and we've made it easier for you to do so. Uh, you can log on and you will get the full search results that you would have previously got as a member. There will be enhanced features that are available for those who purchase credits and for members of the Irish Horse Board. And obviously there's ongoing developments with Coppola Ore, which you'll see rolled out over next year. The Irish Horse Gateway. And the Irish Horse Gateway is uh, the official channel for buying a horse and pony in Ireland. And again, that'll expand to being more than that. This was a screenshot of the Irish Horse Gateway uh, yesterday. And it shows horses for sale, if you wish to buy horses, if you wish to sell horses, how you go about it. And um, this one here is a, a flexible colt. As you can see, it gives a guide price. And it has been very well. It's, it's only been introduced this year, and it is developing at a tremendous rate. So any breeder who wants to try and sell directly to the customer, this is the, the main way through HSI that you can, you can meet your uh, purchaser directly. It's the official channel, as I say, for buying horses and ponies. Or, uh, uh, in Ireland. Some statistics, bearing in mind it's only been introduced, 160 horses are currently for sale on the Irish Horse Gateway, 60 registered sellers, 40,000 ad views per month, now that's huge, 40,000 people who look at the ads, don't just go in and look at about us or anything else, they're looking at specifically the horse sale ads, 40,000 per month. And that's more last month, it was up to 60,000 last month. 10,000 Facebook followers. Where is it reaching? This is a map of the world. The dense area is Ireland and England and America. But it's reaching far and wide. And as I say, it's, it's only in its infancy at the moment. Attendance at trade shows, we went to very few this year, but we attended Kentucky, Badminton, Hickstead, and a few shows in Ireland, the RDS, the Ploughing. And you can see after each attendance where the gateway was the main focus, there was a spike in the traffic uh, that was attending the Irish Horse Gateway. Ploughing it increased by 50%, interestingly. I'm going to leave you with, with um, a special moment from this year. And you're going to hear from the man himself subsequently. But it was probably, uh, certainly, I think for the Irish Sport Horse stud book, the proudest moment this year and thoroughly enjoyable one. Mm -hmm.